worked with aesthetic aesthetic professionals in the past or have spoken to us. Um, we are a uh, dental education center out of the West Coast, located in Los Angeles, and we're also a cash can distributor and a, a distributor of the laundry box. Um, prior to being a distributor, we have about 20 years of uh, dental education background at our facility. So, um, since we figured that a lot of people have some extra time right now, we, we would put together some webinars for everybody, kind of get everybody up to date with the latest technology. And today we have Richard Gent from the Monger Box, and uh, he will be talking about bike spins and articulation using Sarah Mill Mind. So, uh, from here, I'm going to be handing it off to him. Um, Richard, are you there? Yep, sure thing. I'm here. Thanks, Jesse. Uh, and also, everybody, a couple couple things. These are the upcoming webinars uh, that we have, and you will be able to access all these webinars via video. Um, we'll send links after uh, the webinar is done. And if you have any questions, use the question uh, tab on your screen. Uh, don't use the chat tab. Use the question tab, and we'll be stopping periodically to uh, the webinar. So, uh, Richard, I'm going to go ahead and hand it off to you. Awesome. Sounds good. Okay. <clears throat> Looks like um, my screen should be coming up here in a sec. I see, I see my screen. Yeah, I can see your screen. Okay, perfect. <clears throat> All right. So let me... Um, say a quick hello here to everyone i hope everybody's doing great we are gonna look at the splints here i have put a few little slides together just because i feel like it makes the whole process a little easier to explain and uh, it uh, outlines a little bit better what's new what has changed i uh, honestly don't remember when the last time was when i made a webinar about the splints so this is a fantastic opportunity the restoration type has gone nowhere it's still out there there's many different types of splints there's uh, many things to maybe consider when, when getting into them in the, in the first place, but uh, the CAD CAM really makes it easier and the materials have come a far, far way and have received many updates, uh, both in, in uh, the long-term stability as well as in economics. So let's get into this. It's not too many slides, I promise, and then we will have a hands-on uh, section about this. So in essence, a perfectly coordinated system enables every user to fabricate uh, a more interference-free restoration with the aid of digital functional prosthetics. And Amman Gerbach um, buries the, the name function in the name. <laughs> Not literally, but uh, we are almost preaching function, uh, if you know the company, right? And, uh, you know, our Altex articulators, they're uh, amazing devices. The, you know, the Altex articulator, the CR version, is in our Samba Mind CAD software integrated fully. And now we have the newest edition. You see here kind of the old school uh, Facebook on there that's still out there. People are still using it. It's important for some of the splint types. And now we have the Zebra. Now, I didn't really put too much of the Zebras into this presentation because I want to steal the thunder of the actual Zebras webinar, what we also are working on in the background and we will be presenting soon. But into a splint, the Zebras would perfectly fit in. If you don't know what it is, uh, look it up. Uh, it is a digital face bow and it basically gets the face bow position, but also the, the readout for your condylar angle, uh, you can basically auto configure and import that and get your RTX CR automatically configured with the table inclination <clears throat> um, and also with the, the two wings for the lateral attrition left and right. Pretty amazing tool and would fit right into this workflow. All right, the key facts about the splints is, of course, to increase the value of your business by adding high quality restorations. Now, whether that means you're already doing splints and you want to increase the quality of them, or whether that means you want to add a new uh, restoration type, a, one of those different splint types which are out there into your portfolio. Uh, that completely up to you. I don't know where you're at in this process. Uh, SA professionals can help you with training. Um, and Gerbach can help you with training. Um, this, of course, is provided here to give you all the news and information about it. Not necessarily a training, but although I will show you the process and the workflow of designing one. 
It is easy, quick, and functional fabrication through the CAD CAM. I already said that, and we will look in some of those slides here as a side-by-side -side comparison on the manual process versus the CAD CAM. There's new and improved materials. I also mentioned that, and I will go into the in the next slides into more details about it. But we are now able, since a while, to print them, so we have a much lower material cost, or if maybe the material cost is not your first concern, maybe the quality of the product, uh, where I'm kind of coming from, then we have now a new Ace, Ace Flint material launched, which we have a three-year approval, which is amazing. I'll show you a little bit more in a, in a second. Uh, so we have now, I already said it, the excellent long-term stability when milled in the Ace Flint and or a better material cost when printed. And the benefit of CAD CAM, as always, it's reproducible. So what happens if a patient is losing uh, the splint, misplacing it? Um, I don't know how many times my, my wife has looked for her night guard, and I have looked for my uh, retainer after my braces came off. Um, you can just basically hit a button and mill and or print that splint again. So um, the uh, old-fashioned process of doing that, you see there's, there's the pressure part, there's uh, uh, all those little things you need in order to get this done. This is a very nice and clean looking table. It's normally uh, not how that looks like. It's getting fairly messy. It's a dirty workplace and it's a very time consuming um, a process on uh, a real splint, not just a, a suck down night guard. So the side-by-side uh, -side comparison here in between manual and digital, we have on the manual left-hand side here a time-consuming surveying of the model which is necessary, um, and it is very time-consuming to block out the model using wax, where in the digital world we can make one of those block-out models in uh, less than a minute. We can freeform it. Uh, it's automatically basically doing the wax blockout for us, and we can modify and freeform it. So we have a very quick preparation of the models, and we, it's very convenient because we don't need to work with the analog surveyor. The defining of the length of the splint margins is also only possible with time-consuming preparation or extensive reworking of that. And in the digital world, we can contour that very easy. And even if something was off with that, uh, we, we still have the file on hand. We can go back into design. We can make a change. It's time-saving right there as well. Um, it really only needs some finishing time after the splint has been produced. Uh, that's, of course, a little more on the printed one versus a milled one. The surface uh, out of our machines is coming out um, very clean already and requires very little uh, reworking time. Looking at a couple other things, we have uh, time-consuming wax up um, in order to keep that minimum thickness of your splint there. And it's very um, complicated to actually verify that. So you can make a... Uh, educate a guess with it. You can use the wax plates. If you know what the thickness of one of those wax plates is, you can then use a second one um, or third one and then just make the math and, and try to stay on top of your minimum thicknesses. But if then you're ending up having to adjust occlusion um, and uh, removing wax off of it, it's really hard to keep track of um, what the thickness occlusally then is. Uh, those design parameters in the digital world make it really easy because you can set a, a occlusal minimum thickness and a peripheral thickness of the splint, which really makes that um, a breeze to design this and making sure that the splint at the end is stable enough. No rework required. It's automatically, if I'm designing to thin, to thin um, building that material up again. The uh, dynamic and static excursions can only be taken fully into consideration after fabricating and actually curing the acrylic if you're doing that manually. And here in the digital world, we can run it through the articulator already. Like I mentioned, we could put this together with the zebras if we want and uh, import and auto configure our articulator or even uh, use one of those block out models where it's basically using the actual patient movement data. Uh, this is very uh, time-consuming. Um, yep. um, 
Richard, somebody asked how you spell zebra, so they can look it up, and that's the, for the digital face phone. That would be Z-E-B-R-I-S. Um, Susan Zebra, E, Sumeri B, R, I, S. Okay, go ahead. Perfect, perfect, yep. Um, please uh, interrupt me if there's something coming up or something. Uh, it might be easier than going all the way back to, to the beginning. Um, this, is, this is perfect. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. Um, the... Uh, uh, it's very time consuming if you're doing that. If you're basically thinking of making the, the I don't know if you if you ever done a splint, who of you guys has done a splint manually? I remember those. And um, some of those, especially when you're making a custom interior guidance table in order to, to then um, <laughs> open the bite up and really follow what the patient already had, you're looking at a massive amount of time um, making the entire appliance, which is, sort of the explanation why is all those things so expensive very often, right? And I'm not saying necessarily um, you can make a simple suck down and then sell it for, I don't know what, there's still an effort to those, but the the effort to get to the final appliance in a good quality, Biff CatCam uh, has made it a lot easier and takes a lot of that, um, especially sometimes unpredictable analog uh, steps away. It makes them a little bit more repeatable and uh, predictable. So such here, we can automate um, the uh, adaptation of the occlusion. Uh, you already know how that looks like from Crown & Bridge. We can hit a button and our occlusion is basically uh, adjusted, uh, including the dynamics. That of course is if I have the software license for the CRM Altex. Um, Jesse, I think has a slide then what you can show you guys for the item numbers and the prices for the add-on modules. Yeah, um, Richard, before you go any further, there was another question. Um, what material can you print it from on a printer? It really depends on a printer. Uh, I have here in one of the upcoming slides, I have one of the materials for uh, the next 105100 okay. will be integrated into the thermal system. But usually uh, many of the printers, they are close to the material which is approved, such as the, the next end from 3D systems. Uh, there's some open ones. To be honest, I don't really know all the printable materials that well from uh, the competition what's out there, but I have printed some with the Nextend 5100 and uh, I've milled um, splints here. Okay, um, so the occlusal context can really be in increased selectively, can be worked on, um, and you can make that run through on the screen so much easier than the, the lengthy back and forth of oh, now I ground too much, let me add some uh, resin to this again so I, I have some meat on the bone and I can grind some of the other contacts in again and that back and forth. Um, very time consuming, very frustrating at times. Um, and then at the end, eventually you're dealing with some bubbles because you were rushing and then you were distracted and yeah, it's a bit of a mess uh, doing that analog. Okay, let's fly through comparison here very quick uh, on digital versus manual. So this is the, the polishing and finishing time, designing, sprinkling, and or scanning or preparation time in a comparison. And uh, this is actually a fairly old slide from when we didn't even have the fast uh, milling for the splints. We have since a while, we have single cutter rotos, which I love, they're amazing, and they, significantly uh, came down with the milling time because of those single cut or single flute uh, rotos. Um, the working time, of course, varies depending on the different splint types. And I am not uh, absolute experts in all of the different splint types. There's some which require uh, a lot of um, uh, things to be considered if you're staying in that workflow in order to call it a certain splint. Uh, but of course, we have therapeutic uh, splints, stabilizing uh, or Michigan splints. We have uh, positioning splints for uh, the displacement of the cartilage disc. And we have just simple occlusal splints to prevent uh, proxism or basically a better night guard. Um, the uh, milled splints are, in our case, a true transparent PMMA if milled. And that's kind of maybe one of the reasons why I still tend to recommend the milling at this time over the printing, but both are, are valuable options. It kind of depends a little bit. Maybe you're ending up even offering two different splint types, uh, like an eco version 
and a, a little bit better uh, long-lasting version. So you see that here, the long-term use used to be for our splint tag material 12 months. And now with the uh, relaunched uh, A-splint uh, material, we have three years, that is crazy. It's a medical device uh, and it's a true clear color as you can see in that picture. It has a bit of a blue hint to it from the background from what's in the machine, but it's truly clear. While some of the printed materials, so sometimes they have a bit of a, uh, a different color in it, whether that be a bit of a blue or green, or you've seen on the surgical guide, sometimes it's a bit of a yellow orange. The milling time of a splint is somewhat in between 45 minutes to an hour and a half. And uh, that depends just on what machine do you have? Is that dry milled or wet milled? You see that here the Miko 5X uh, since a while can do dry milled splints with those single cutter tools. And uh, if you're wet milling, it can usually go a little bit faster and the single cutter tools enable the fast milling. So that makes up for that time difference. Also splints can be very different. Uh, some people prefer them on the maxillary. Um, we've been doing them on the mandible for decades. And um, <clears throat> I don't want to start the discussion over what is right or wrong, where to put them. What I'm trying to say is, uh, if you're comparing the milling time of a lower versus a maxillary, where you have the pellet uh, also covered, then of course you have a longer milling time on the maxillary. Here's, as a comparison, the Nextend Author Rigid, what you could use and um, that, as you can see in the picture, it has a bit of a turquoise blue. It's a funny material. If you try to take a picture with your phone, it changes color. It looks more blue in real life, I would say, and it looks a little bit more on the green end if you're trying to take a picture with it. Um, I guess from the auto correction, color correction from the phones. <clears throat> the printed ones, of course, being um, much less expensive but with the material cost per appliance. So you've heard eventually, if not, uh, it shouldn't take too long to cover this slide really quick. Heard eventually about the relaunch of the PMMA portfolio from Amangawa. We, uh, all our acrylics are now uh, running under the A line. So there's A splint, an A temp, an A cast, uh, and all, all the such. And we have new and improved shades which match together with our um, zirconia shades. And uh, particularly now here on the A splint, uh, we have really significant improvement on the long-term stability and uh, uh, the, what the patient is basically allowed to wear the appliance from 12 months to three years. I think that is crazy. I don't even know if the appliance uh, ultimately can be kept up that long for three years. Um, I guess that really then depends on the patient and how well they are cleaning it, etc. The uh, A-splint will replace in the long run the similar splint deck, if not already happened. Um, like I already mentioned, it's the same price point and uh, three years here uh, to satisfy both the dentists and the patients. It's very different on, this, on the printed ones. And of course, price-wise, um, I, I left this slide in here to give you a rough idea. We are the dark blue ones here with the A-splint. Um, this is a little bit different for our zirconia. We are known to have very, very high quality and very aesthetic products, which are usually a little bit on the higher end on the on the price point. Here on the Splintech, it's actually that we're very much in line, if not less expensive than other uh, competitors out here, not naming exactly who's who. All I can tell you is the, the gray one uh, is our old uh, Splintech material and the blue one is the new updated uh, A-Splint. Okay, so I already mentioned we get a high surface quality if we are milling them with our salmon machines and uh, that minimizes really the post-processing time. And not just the material, uh, that it's approved for X amount of time in the patient's mouth. Um, if you print something, you, you can tell those print lines on there, um, regardless of the quality of the splint um, or of the printer and of the, uh, is it 50 or 25 micron? You usually see some of those print lines. Um, the surface quality, I feel like on a milled splint, uh, in particular on the inside, I feel like is, is that important 
um, is is a little bit better, I feel. Uh, along that, together with the clear material, um, for a higher cost and quality appliance, I probably mill them for now. For night guard or whatever, yeah, you can probably print them. The industrial manufactured materials, um, they have a very low uh, rest monomer amount in them. So that's uh, not only more pleasant for the patient, but also safer, uh, because we know that uh, monomers are carcinogens, right? And um, we basically eliminated that manual fabrication process um, uh, and the monomers assigned and associated with them as well. Okay, so I think it is time to do some hands-on, but I'm gonna give you guys the option to ask some questions about this. And I also wanted to show really quick um, how we are organized here uh, with our key account managers before we go to the hands-on. Um, we have here both the dance, then Cook and then Haver, Brian Lee and Nancy with their contact information and where they are assigned to. One more time, I'm gonna go back here to the map so you can see if you need some, some help, um, information about our milling units, the science software, et cetera, which maybe uh, you might end up talking when you're talking to Jesse and EP with one of those guys regardless. Okay, Jesse, do we have any questions before I go to the hands-on? Uh, let me give it a couple of seconds to see if any come in. I don't have any questions yet. Okay, awesome. That's fantastic. Then I'm trying to still talk into uh, the microphone as best as I can. But of course, whilst I'm designing, I might look at the screen and I might uh, lose the focus a little bit. So I hope that's going to work out. I'm not going to try and explain you every single detailed feature. Uh, I'm going to try to provide you uh, a overview in the workflow and in what are the required steps to, to get to the final end product, um, in particular focus on the design portion of this and articulation as the webinar title says. So um, we'll actually, um, Paul, Richard, um, somebody asked for you to show the emails again. Can you come back real quick and show it? Yep, absolutely. Do that very really quick. Mm -hmm. um, here. Okay. Maybe you can take a picture of your phone or something or do a screenshot. And then I'll go back to the territory map here in a second as well. So you know which state you're in and who is and, your person. Yeah, and everybody we are recording this too. So uh, you'll, yep. you will get a, a, a video. Yep, perfect. Okay. All right, so in our ThermoMind database, and this is this is very uh, similar on the ExoCAD side, right? Um, our software is ExoCAD based. In case you didn't know this, uh, it doesn't only look familiar, it's actually ExoCAD based. Yes, we, we branded it, but we also integrated it. So um, the, the true difference is how the files which are you designing here are then ending up in the, in the CAM software and your nesting, how they're ending up in the machine, and all those design parameters which you chose, uh, in our case, our default values here, what I will be using, are they producing something what fits your model or the patient's mouth at the end when using a cell mill milling unit? That's a big question. So we have everything created here as uh, byte splint, as you can see, if I click one more time on, on one of those teeth here, we have, of course, our selection of the machines. If I would have installed the Matic here or printer at the system, I would have also gotten those options. Then we, I'm going to go into the Samomind CAD software. We scanned this, of course, um, with a desktop scanner in our case, but you could also utilize a 
intra all scan. If you're ending up printing your splints anyways, you can also in the second run print a bunch of models and then uh, verify that. Although I'm usually not the, the biggest fan of verifying something printed on the exact same printer. So um, the idea is if your if your printer has an issue uh, and your splint comes out with a distortion, then your, your model might also have the same distortion and you don't really see it on the model until everything goes into the, the patient's mouth. So um, a little bit of maintenance, et cetera, is required. Uh, and uh, ultimately we'll find it in the, uh, the patient's mouth, of course. I'm going to say load um, scan data only. Um, like I mentioned, we scan it with a desktop scanner, but you could also use an intro all one and then just import this. And we're getting here already the uh, uh, basically the, the undercuts showing and the result of what I, an imaginable step would I have to be doing with the server error. I'm going to change this a little bit. I'm going to set the insertion direction from view. I hit the apply button. I can play around with this a little bit. So if I wanted to uh, change the amount of undercuts here, and you can see how the red is changing, where depending on how you think that a splint should be designed and where it should stop, uh, you can change the path of insertion to make that happen that your either going into the undercut or not going into undercut for more or less retention. Uh, I'm going to, like I mentioned, use the standard values here. You uh, can play around here basically and change the fitting of the um, internal surface of the splint and make that a little tighter, a little looser, block out more. You can actually freeform that block out model, what we created um, or what we're creating right now. And um, change it just like you're used to it from a wax um, model. Okay, I'm in this case, I'm not doing this. And we're looking at this as already mounted um, with an open byte. So I'm gonna start, and you see here, this is this low draw movement data from file. I'm gonna say start articulator now. The articulator now is telling me, hey, there is a distance, there's a gap in between my upper and the lower. Uh, this gap is pretty significant here. Uh, you could see it on the screen there before. So in my case, making uh, the use of remove gap here is not really what I want to do. It is okay, I want to leave this gap because this was already uh, established in the patient's mouth. Okay, so there's two different ways how you can do this. You can either, um, set your your articulator and I can go back and I can show you the other way in a, in a moment here as well. Um, you can go back and um, do this in the articulator. You can also do that in the patient's mouth. You can make a check bite. You can see um, with some with some wax, you can basically determine this there and then mount your models already in, in this open position uh, and or scan the bite in that position. Yeah. Um, and uh, basically have it ready and set where you know you have the space available, what you need. Or maybe it's a therapeutic thing where you uh, gradually want to open the bite and then you maybe actually produce a couple of appliances. I'm not going to go into all the different details on this, but those are the options basically you have, right? Now we can choose here the uh, individual anterior guidance table or the anterior uh, average guidance table. Currently I'm on a flat table um, that maybe doesn't make the most uh, sense uh, in in the case of the splint. Let me just switch over to the average anterior guidance table so you see how that looks like. And uh, those are average values of course. And for that reason, it's always maybe a little bit better if you would be already having an Altex articulator and you have that individual anterior guidance tables, a very useful tool, in my opinion. Uh, you can basically determine the, uh, the angulation of those uh, with the scale on your actual articulator. What do I mean with that? Um, I can mount my model in occlusion, um, not open as this is right now here, I'm mounting it in occlusion and then I'm making a protrusion uh, and I then change the incisal table inclination until the table will touch the incisal pin. So let me go back here a little bit. If I 
would now make a protrusion with those in occlusion, the incisal pin would be in the ear somewhere. If I do that with my analog on the articulator, and then I can incline the table until it touches the pin. Then I can get a reading from my articulator, the analog articulator, and transfer this into my digital articulator. Very quick and easy way of getting a readout, um, which is actually true for your patient. And you can do the same thing for your lateral occlusion left and right. You could combine that with check bites, what you get from your from your doctor, um, from your patient, and uh, be very exact, uh, relatively exact with them. Maybe not quite as good as with a Zebras, but uh, you're already making steps into the right direction. Okay, let me do just some values what I'm um, thinking this could be. And let's say maybe something like this. 48 or something like that, maybe 49 sounds about right to me. Um, and I leave that up to you how you're determining those. Again, the Zebras does that for you, or you can do that with the uh, analog version of this table here, or you could do a custom table, right? And then you can kind of estimate the angulation. And you see now, even with the byte open, I'm following those. Uh, uh, th those values of the patient. I hope that makes sense. And once the articulator is uh, done, I can say OK. And I can now basically, if I wanted to, repeat protrusion, lateral protrusion, everything. I'm going to go to the next step. And I'm going to draw in now my lint outline. And here we see a little bit of undercut. Maybe in the interior, we're not going to go too far down here and we'll kind of remain a little shorter. And again, how long or short, I leave that up to your preferences. And what the requirements for the splints are. There's even a method of um, adding occlusion to a splint if you desire to do that. I'm going a little bit into the undercut area so that I get a little bit of a, um, a retention Maybe not the most important on the lower versus the, the upper, but uh, we still want that safely in place. And the patient speaks. And then here it's up to you again, how long or how short are you making this? Uh, you could go all the way down to the gum line. I'm not going to go all the way up uh, down to the gum line now. I'll make this a little shorter. But again, that's up to you and your design preferences and ultimately maybe the patient. Um, if in doubt, make it a little longer uh, because you can easily trim it away. Okay, you can also take a screenshot or you could take a, a red pencil and you could take those undercut areas here, what you see, and paint them on your model roughly so that you know in case the splint is a little too tight, you already know where to grind. Okay, <clears throat> it basically created already my uh, splint, but uh, it's not very well supported occlusally at this point. And Yes, I can bring my antagonist in. I can hit the A button on the keyboard to do that as well. I love the shortcuts. Um, or you can do the control and mouse click and then bring it back with shift and control, whatever, toggle the transparency. But <clears throat> it's a good idea to know where we need to go, but a lot easier than uh, bringing the antagonist in, I find it's actually using the uh, occlusal heat map. Um, and in this particular case, it's disabled. 
uh, but it will come active in just a moment once we're in the next step. So here we have, again, we have a couple of options to change what we're seeing on the screen. We have the occlusal thickness, I said, uh, especially on the analog uh, method of making those splints. This is a bit of a struggle to verify your occlusal thickness, the peripheral thickness, and some smoothing. So you can um, change those up a little bit, and you see that very important checkbox here. If you ever um, want to make a uh, design on the maxillary, including the palette, then here is your check mark for it. Okay, I'm going to say next. This will basically bring me already to the next step. Actually, let me go back one more time. Here's a posterior area tab, which we could actually make use of if we wanted to. So we can just left click here and define that. And then we could immediately flatten the posterior here for us if we wanted to. Um, and you can combine this with the occlusal thickness. Yeah, you can basically make this thicker, get some um, intrusions, and then cut them away. Okay, so let's go to the next uh, portion of it. Actually, minimum thickness was maybe a little bit too much now, maybe too hefty. Let's bring this down a little bit. Um, okay, and the next step we can freeform this and we can add material, remove material, and we want to have something on the uh, guidance here from canine guidance, anterior guidance, right? And the, the best way making this quick and easy is with a high strength and with a big uh, brush size and really get at it and add material here. And maybe I want to bring the antagonist in now to see where I'm actually heading with this. And add the material in. There. Don't be worried that it's too much because with a click of a button, we will move that in a second. And get your contact points here going. And feel free to switch this over from intersection into contact point if that's easier for you. If you're used to that view. Get those in here. Let's get those in here. See, that's very quick. We have a big brush and um, a high strength setting. Okay. Now we can basically go to adapt at the anatomic. I'm rarely using that, but you could basically grab something as well and just drag this up or down or to the side. Um, I do it the way I just showed it to you. And then you can define um, the desired distance and you can maybe cut on zero, cut on whatever you want to cut. We already opened the byte up here and I leave this on dynamic. And now I can cut the intersections. And what it will do is we'll actually consider the lateral intrusion, left and right, etc. So although there that was just one click of a button, it actually went through all this. And you see nothing is getting red anymore. So there's no reason for me to actually repeat this here. This is just for me to verify. So if I wanted to make a protrusion, then I can, and I can see where the contact points ending up being. But all of them are, are very even. And all I have to do now basically is smoothen those sharp edges here a little bit. Um, and again, this is becoming more precise um, the more information you have from your patient. Right. Whether that be a FACEBO uh, analog, whether that be a, um, a pre-op model, what you analyzed with the Altex articulator and the individual interior guidance table, um, totally up to you. But the more information you get from the patient uh, and what you can transfer into and program the articulator, the better. The less handwork you'll have to do and the, the less uh, touch-ups you'll have to do in the patient's mouth. There's a bit of a bump, so I'm gonna even that out a little bit. And now we have everything nicely supported. Um, if some of those contact areas are a little bit too much for you, of course, you can go in with the remove and uh, you can remove some material here and 
make them less of the surface and go crazy with it. This seems a little strong for me here in the back, so let's reduce this a little bit. Do the lingual ones a bit. Break them up a bit, maybe a little much. And this one seems a little stronger than the rest. Although I'm I'm okay with that if that's anterior, if that uh, is like heavy in the posterior, I would definitely uh, soften that out and get rid of that. And then we can go back to our smoothing option and we can fine tune things a little bit. Um, and you're basically already uh, done with it. It is merging the files now. Uh, you have options to to change the finishing line if you wanted to if you're unhappy with it uh, there's um, a protection for it you can disable that you can smoothen over this a little bit uh, i try to make this um, smoother right um, that there's not too many sharp edges on it and those little things here you may be ending up polishing them away so it's it's a trade off how much time do you spend on the CAD versus how much time do you spend post processing? And uh, well, we're basically technically done. We could now say proceed to production from here, and uh, we could bring this into a puck, we could nest this, we could throw this onto our printer, uh, uh, create our supports and uh, go at it. And of course, this is now the integration, this is taking the file placing this into my puck. It's already uh, suggesting me the correct materials here. It's opening and connecting to the machine for me um, and it's helping me out with this. It's telling me the height uh, so I know what kind of blank to to get. I don't have to tell the software anything anymore that this is the splint and, and uh, where a margin line here is or my, my finishing line, I should say. Uh, it already knows all that. That's uh, the integration. Here I can now pick my machine. Let's say I want to put this onto a Matic. Then I can say here, add a blank. I haven't uh, refreshed after the update. It's going to take a second here. Then I create my A splint temp and uh, nest it, create some sprues here and there. I can have the machine uh, pre-cut those so that I can basically push this out of the puck and uh, fine tune it a little bit and uh, be be done already with it. I'm going to show some of the sprueing here a little bit, but I, I don't want to make this the main focus. Um, let's see if we have any questions. And whilst you guys are looking for questions or typing something, I'm going to just show and uh, how this looks like. Yeah, but, but I don't I don't have any questions yet, so we can okay. continue going. Awesome. So here's our puck. The 98 is nice for splints. A little trick is here. If you right click the splint and you say duplicate, then um, you, not that I want to mill to right now, but you get a space holder, which is um, very convenient to figure out how can I nest this and I can actually squeeze two of them in a puck. And if you saw how I initially had that in there, um, I probably never would have ended up nesting it that way. Now I kind of positioned them in a way that, yep, I likely gonna get a second one in there. And I can now remove this one here again, and I can play around with this one here. Fine tune my connectors. Uh, what also is a nice little trick is if you um, right click it and then say uh, connectors, connectors, where is it? Maybe here. Fresh connectors. Uh, we do have a question. Uh, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. uh, we do have a question. Um, uh, somebody wants to know: Is this a standard capability in Cerebro Mine or additional module? Um, it is uh, mm -hmm. an additional module for the splint design, and then there is the, the Arctic regulation that is an additional module as well. Uh, and we'll cover that at, at the very as far as prices and, and what you would need. Perfect. That's exactly right. So I would always say the uh, Altex, and, I, and I, I basically tell that everybody, the Altex um, license as add-on license, if I would have to narrow it down to just one single one, which is gonna help me with whatever I'm doing in it, um, the Altex one's the first one I would buy. 
<clears throat> because it's there's such a big value in it, whether that's a single crown, whether that's a splint or a full arch case. The um, saving so much bench work and bench time. And uh, the Altex is, in my opinion here, for the splints required, even for the simpler ones, and uh, the uh, M-splint. Those are the two licenses you're looking in. So you see me already creating connectors. I made a right click and I deleted them all because I find that easier than uh, getting rid of them individually. And so now I'm just moving around, adding a couple more. Uh, and then I could even say every second one I want to cut off and cut off. And then you see what's happening. It's actually cutting it at the anatomy 100% through. So I'm ending up only holding it in place with maybe one, two, three, with, which are cut with 50. And then I can probably break this out of the puck without even using a, a tool. Um, and since it's doing that reduction at the very, very ends, uh, there's nothing wrong with that because the splint is milled already at that time. Uh, we do have a, another question. Um, how much space do you suggest between connectors? How much space? I kind of stagger them. If you're looking at it from the occlusal view here, um, this one is not perfect, but there there's one right, left, right, and then technically here, left, and then right. And I, I kind of eyeball it like this. I don't really know if I can put a millimeter number on it, but that's roughly what I'm doing. And this is probably uh, very sufficient. So it is already on the safe side. You can probably do a couple less even. I don't know. I mean, technically, if I really want to stagger them, I would not do it this way here. Yeah. That's uh, That looks sufficient to me. I usually raise them up a little bit. They're a little bit uh, close to the finish line sometimes. And so it's this one. This is a staggering stuff is good advice in general when nesting, whether that's a splint or if that's a, uh, a bridge. Um, and then not only staggering them left and right, but also staggering them um, in the vertical. So if we're looking at just these three here, one, two, three, I could have low, high, and low, if that makes sense. Um, because then I basically, instead of if I connect them, I get right now I get sort of a you get a line if you stagger them in the uh, in the vertical as well, you get a triangle. So you get a bigger area of um, you know, of your of your strength of the connectors altogether. Okay, so they may not be perfect, but they're there. I'm going to say proceed to production. And um, now uh, I should have tried that. Sorry, guys, I moved the computer into the home office. Now it can't find the machine and uh, I can't really calculate this. I would normally say start calculation at this point and uh, then it would run for five minutes or whatever. And then you feed it to your machine. In case you're printing this, you're coming into your folder. You're looking for your SDL file. And you have your byte splint CAD 3D object right here as an STL file. And if I open this STL file, good. Drag and drop it into your printer software, whichever you're using. Or if you have our Nextend, you can use the integrated Nextend 5100 tool here and send that over to the printer. Right? That's it. And I hope this was easy enough. Um, I, um, maybe there's some questions about certain splint types or whatever. Feel free to to reach out me out to me personally. Um, my work email address is Richard R I C H A R D dot Jens J E N T S C H at amangebach dot com A M A N N G I R R B A C H dot com. Get, get a hold of me. Jesse has my contact information as well. Um, if you have Jesse's or whatever, for free, go through him, request it. Uh, email me your questions, um, ask them to Jesse. And uh, if there's anything uh, very specific on this, let me know. And I'm sure we can answer it for I, you. I'll switch it over to, um, to, to the screen with all the modules. Um, and if anybody has any questions, feel free to ask them now. Um, Richard, can you just kind of explain the modules if, if, if I switch over the screen? Yep. Let me do that. Let me just try to find the screen. Uh, 
Oh, there it is. It took a second for it to come up. I can see it now. Okay, great. Yeah, there it is, it is. yes. <clears throat> so the Samuel Mind uh, base module, that is your, that's your uh, CAD software, right? Um, so you can, you can make crowns, bridges, veneers, inlays, onlays, um, what else? Um, telescopic crowns, I think, with it. Uh, doesn't matter if it's a single unit or a bridge or whatever it is. Uh, the uh, uh, implant is our implant software module, of course. The Samo Mindforms is is a uh, is a Knut Miller library, um, which includes the cutback library, which includes uh, the thimbles now, which are um, relevant for the restoration types. What you've seen maybe this morning uh, with uh, Mo Whitlock, my coworker, presenting on the the engine module, the thimble uh, for large cases. Uh, Microshell is extra provisionals. Uh, M-Splint is the module you need for this particular webinar, what we just walked you through, together with the Altex, Samuel Altex CR virtual articulator, what you see here on the screen. Um, M-Build would be to make a digital model, so if you're working on intra-all scan data, uh, you can convert that easily into a, um, a digital model, which is not just a hollow mesh, uh, but it's closed at the bottom. You can make uh, removable dyes if you wish to do so, so for crown and virtual, whatever. Um, and in our case, really just for verification purposes. Uh, then we have the uh, D-Flow, is a denture module, one of them at least. And that's currently also being worked on and updated and upgraded and getting additional functionality. The um, MGIN you saw this morning, hopefully with Mo. If not, uh, if you missed it, let Jesse know and he can send you the link to the recording. True Smile, I didn't really make use of this here uh, in this particular one, uh, but it helps you to uh, see the actual shade so that you can have an easier process when nesting your, your restorations in a solid um, multi-layer park, um, whether that be the HT Gen X or whether that be the solid FX ML, where you have two shades in one park or one shade in, in one park. It helps you when you're changing the vertical position of the crown in the puck. It helps you when you're putting it together with M-Smile, what you see on the screen here, the Smile Designer software. I can actually change the, the shades and offer something as a proposal to the patient. So you have a before and after um, kind of image of the patient before it's even done. Um, Empower does the partial software, RPDs. And bars is, uh, as the name suggests, is for for bars, um, implant-based bars. Together, if you combine it with the implant software, right? Um, and uh, and pass is that module what you need for the zebra. So it's kind of breaking into two separate segments. The M pass is sort of the the lab license, so to say, and the M um, the zebras is the actual digital face bow which creates the data. Then theoretically, it goes to the lab. The lab gets the data set and then imports it using the MPASS. And ultimately, the uh, BD creator is basically also a denture module, um, but uh, it's the Baltic denture workflow. Well, thank you, Richard. And um, everybody, we are offering a pretty aggressive discounts right now as the prices in red is uh, the prices right now, and then the MSRP would be. Uh, just the uh, regular shaded crown light. So, in addition to uh, rest of this discount, we are offering 0% financing uh, for purchases 5000 and up, and we have different terms, one, two, or three years, and we can even push it out for six months so you don't make a payment for six months. If you wanted to, you know, start uh, learning the software right now, or, you know, later on, if, if you want to look into it, so you can always give, give us a call in here, so our contact information. Um, you can go and reach either one of us at any time, uh, including evenings and weekends. We're always available. And that's our email address on there and, and phone number. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody for attending. And if you have any questions, reach out. Otherwise, look for an email to come from us with uh, a link to the video of the webinar Richard just okay. And again, thank you. Thank you, Richard, for the webinar. It was very informative. And um, Thanks for having me. we'll be sending also everybody a list of upcoming webinars, which we have a lot more coming. Uh, Richard, is there anything else you want to close with? 
Nope. I just want to say thank you, everyone, for joining. Um, I hope this was uh, short enough and still informative and enough and, and fun. Um, if it was, let me know, let Jesse know, and hopefully uh, we'll see you guys around. All right. Thank you. I appreciate it.